Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Our guest today is Jim Ambusky. Jim is a digital historian at the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. As an historian of the American Revolution, Jim studies the relationship between Scotland and America during that era. He's also a podcaster, digital humanist, and storyteller. Jim, it's a pleasure to have you on the Success Insight Podcast. Well, Howard, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me and for having me. Fantastic. And for our listeners, in the spirit of full disclosure, because I have a lot of those full disclosures on each episode, I actually came across Jim on a kind of a podcasting clearinghouse where podcasters and guests are introducing themselves to each other. And, and I really wasn't interested in the how I went from rags to riches and can make you seven figures in six months. And I came across Jim's profile and he's a digital historian. He's in studies, the American revolution. And I thought, wow, that could be a really interesting podcast. And so I know I'm going to be learning something today and I know you will. So without further ado, again, Jim, welcome. Well, thank you. And I hope I don't disappoint because that was a very nice introduction. <laughs> thank you. And I. I found as I was listening to some of your episodes, you have a lot of esteemed scholars on your podcast, and we're going to get a, a little into that. But I do think the background, just being up at Mount Vernon and the George Washington Library, and by the way, in full, scan the spirit of full disclosure, I lived in Washington for like nine months, and I never made it to Mount Vernon. And I feel really bad about that now that I'm <laughs> chatting with you. Well, that's all right. We come back anytime and we'll give you the VIP tour. I love, I love that. Thank you. And you come to Las Vegas and I'll give you that tour as well. Excellent. Fantastic. So how did you get involved and in, what was this, this growing interest that you had? Like, I want to get into the research and his history mm -hmm. and the American revolution. How'd that show up for you? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. It's, I guess it started when I was a kid. Uh, I was always very interested in history. My original life goal was to be an aerospace engineer. Uh, unfortunately, aerospace engineering requires a great deal of math and math is not my strong suit. So in the interest of not getting people killed, I thought, actually, let's study people who were already dead and I'll become a historian. And the, uh, the American founding moment, the revolution was always my favorite. I really liked the dynamism of that particular era, the explosion of energy that takes place in the mid to late 18th century that gives birth to the United States, but also the complexity of that world. And it, it, when I was a kid, right, I was like most Americans who just see it as the American independence movement. But as I have become more of a professional historian and looked at it at a wider angle and a wider lens, it's a much more dynamic, complicated, complex uh, history than uh, I think most of us would realize, especially at that young age. And so I, I, I got into it via the founding fathers, but it's so much more. And that's the kind of work that excites me and telling those stories of folks whose stories are not normally told is what gets me up every day. One of the takeaways from doing the research for this episode, and I didn't really appreciate it until I'm going through the website, listening to a couple episodes is our classroom studies, whether it's elementary school, high school, college, unless you make a choice or are able to, you probably don't have a choice when you're a kid, unless you make that choice to go further, you are barely touching the tip of the iceberg about that complexity. And you just share that. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And you know, because in grade school, the objective is to give you a solid liberal arts foundation so that you could be potentially a good citizen, right. And participate in civic life and have the knowledge base that you need to, to be successful and get career employment, things like that. And social studies, of course, is one element of that education, but there's only so much that teachers can do. And, and teachers of course are already overburdened with the amount of stuff that they have to communicate to their students. So you have to kind of go to the lowest common denominator, the simplest narrative. And in this case, the American revolution is the independence movement. It creates the United States. 
And uh, it's born out of American resistance to a quote unquote British tyranny in some ways. But when you begin to peel back the layers, right? And if you choose to pursue the history further, either on your own as a student, an undergraduate student in college, or even in high school or grade school, there is so much more, as I was saying earlier, and we can begin to look at that moment in, in different ways. Instead of looking at it as an independence movement, we can look at it as a civil war on multiple levels, an, an imperial civil war between two British peoples, an internal civil war between patriots and loyalists. And when you begin to reframe it and ask those different kinds of questions, there are a, a lot more stories that you can tell in, in ways that you may not necessarily get in those, that early primary education. Another insight that, that came across for me today is not only the parties involved, as you just said, could have been an internal civil war, the, 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 the loyalists, the, the colonists, you mm -hmm. had the, the, the two countries or the, the aspiring country in, in British rule, but right. definitely people's as well. I mean, you had these two groups of the Europeans and, and the new, and the, the new set, the new folks over in, in the States, but you had the Indians, their mm -hmm. competing factions, and then you overlaying that with slavery, which right. was rampant even back then. Right. It's a really important point because it is so much more complex than just simply Euro-Americans versus the British. There are various indigenous peoples involved in the 18th century who are vying for power vis-a-vis -vis these various respective European powers. Of course, as you pointed out, slavery is pervasive throughout the North American colonies, even in places we don't normally associate with slavery, like New England, slavery is there. But, you know, particularly here in Virginia, it is an integral part of life. And during the war, enslaved people play a significant role in the revolution, most, is, most importantly, on the British side of the equation, when thousands upon thousands of enslaved people escape to British lines and serve the crown in an attempt to quell the rebellion. So there are, there are so many more people involved. Women are another concrete example. There is a lot of wonderful scholarship. A lot of historians are writing about the centrality of women to the American revolution, both in terms of their role either on the battlefield or the ways in which wives take over and run family farms and family businesses as husbands go to Continental Congress or become soldiers, things like that. So a lot of the research these days is focusing on how people experience the war. And that we, we, we agree on probably 95% of what happened and why. I mean, that 5% is where we have those most vigorous debates. Why did the colonies revolt? Things like that. What did it mean uh, for the empire as the colonies did so? But what a lot of historians have been doing is looking at how, how people like Catherine Green, how people like William Lee, who was George Washington's enslaved valet, how did they experience the war? What do the sources tell us? How can we ask fresh questions of the evidence so that we can get at their experiences and have a much richer portrait of this defining moment in American history? As you begin to kind of gather up and grow this interest around American history, this, this period of time. When this opportunity came to join the, the, the Fred W. Smith National Library, mm -hmm. how, how did that opportunity present itself for you? And from my perspective, it, it's kind of like being a kid in a, in a intellectual candy store. It really is. It's a. It's a, uh, it's a question or the answer to that question is one that reflects kind of the state of the job market for historians, but also the ways in which professional historians are trained these days. And so to back up a little bit, when I started my graduate program and my PhD program in 2009, I kind of went into it thinking that I would be a professor. I would finish my degree and then I would get a tenure track job and it would be great. I would get tenure, so I would be untouchable. I could do whatever I wanted within certain limits. But, but this was also a time when the academic job market wasn't that great, super terrible now. So and if, if any of your listeners are out there thinking about graduate school, let's have a conversation before you do that. But I almost immediately knew, actually after, actually after having conversations with some mentors, that I needed to diversify my skill set if I want to do 
have a fighting chance of either being a professor or at least staying in the profession in some way. So when my, when I began my first year of graduate school, I actually began dabbling in digital humanities and digital history very carefully at first, actually with the Washington papers, the papers of George Washington project is based at the university of Virginia, where I did my graduate degree. And my the second semester of my first year, I became a research assistant there and learned how to use some digital tools to produce those papers. And subsequently I moved on to a couple of other projects over at the Virginia foundation for the humanities who were building this comprehensive database called people of the founding era that lists and identifies all the people named in the published papers of men like Washington, Jefferson, whatnot, and began to see the power and utility of using digital technology to not only create resources to facilitate research, but also use digital technology to analyze sources and uh, make new arguments about the past and ask new questions about the past. And it's it, in some ways it it's worked out because I, I went on the traditional job market as one would expect of a, a historian was got some interviews, had some good conversations with folks, but ultimately was unsuccessful in landing that tenure track job. But fortunately my work in the digital humanities led to a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Virginia Law School, where I worked on a, a couple of digital projects. And then ultimately, based on that experience, got me this. So it was about being flexible enough so that I could pivot into opportunities, have at least the skills that were necessary to be conversant uh, in this world, and then keep learning along the way and so that I could give myself a chance to be successful in the profession that I had chosen. I have to first applaud you and you were able to make a pivot from to a certain extent, a very traditional professor, as you said, tenure track, teaching students, graduate students, doing some research, writing papers, and this whole avenue of the digitization of all of our content mm -hmm. at the, all those libraries and perhaps even private files from people's homes and by digitizing it and categorizing it and having keywords, et cetera, I, it, it comes across that this is like a treasure trove of really starting to, as you're saying, connecting the dots beyond just the stories we were initially told when we were in school. Yeah, the advent of digitization has been remarkable. And if we think about it, right, the internet as we've known it has only been around since 1993. Now, unfortunately, I have students these days who were born way after 1993. So it's weird to them to say the internet's not that old, but historians began using, historians have been using technology for a long time. And so have libra librarians, but once the internet came along, we realized that we could digitize documents and put them on the web. That, that, that democratizes knowledge that makes it possible for folks, professional historians like myself, or just the interested public to go read these primary sources. And as you say, Howard, right, not only digitize documents of men like Washington, but digitize documents of ordinary people, or even one of the things that I've worked on extensively is legal records, which at first can be very opaque and kind of off-putting, but then in legal records, of course in the process of litigation, you see people at their worst and at their best. And then out of those kinds of materials, you can get those kinds of stories and connect those dots, as you say, and open up new worlds for research and storytelling. So it's been, it's great. Now, of course, there's, there's so much of it. How do you make your way through it? And, and you have to figure out how to navigate and prioritize and refine your questions. But and especially in, but especially in this moment, you know, in the COVID moment, a lot of people could not get to the archives. And fortunately, a lot of archives responded by digitizing material and putting even more stuff online. There's no substitute for actually being in the archives and holding the original documents. But as a less expensive jaunt, it's easier to go on the web and, and look at some documents as opposed to, in my case, since I study Scotland, fly to Edinburgh on a regular basis and, and dig through the archives. 
you know, I, I, I think I'd like to be in Edinburgh, but I point your point is taken. Oh, uh, what, so would I, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you drink whiskey by the way, or scotch. <laughs> yes. Uh, actually I will be going home this evening cause it's Friday and I will be enjoying a nice Talisker. So uh, uh, fantastic. Good yeah. choice. Good choice. Yeah. So I, I'm curious with the library and this, the, the research orientation of it, mm -hmm. is it devoted solely to, to scholars, educators, researchers, or is there a public component to the work that the, the this aspect of the library is doing? Yeah. So here at the Smith library and we call it, we just call it the Washington library for kind of shorthand. Okay. And so the, the Washington library is open by appointment. It, it does primarily cater to researchers, professional researchers who were doing work on the Washington, on the era of the American Revolution, early Republic, or Mount Vernon itself. But that said, if you have a legitimate research interest, you can certainly make an appointment with us. We do support, we do have a robust fellowship program. Uh, so we actually have several, several fellowships that support scholars coming in for one, three, and six month periods to use our collections, to work with our on site experts on a variety of topics uh, that are, are related to our collections or to the history of Mount Vernon and Washington. And it, it's great because uh, these folks are producing exciting new research. They're writing exciting new books. And we've been able to, you know, help facilitate more a greater public understanding of Washington, Mount Vernon, and, and that entire period by virtue of supporting this kind of scholarship. And even to the point now, where as a consequence of COVID, we've been live streaming like crazy. And so we have book talks with our former fellows as they publish their books. And so that is a, another avenue in which they can share their work with the wider. I have to share, and I love that you just, what you just shared is when I first started the podcast, my business partner who handles the, the back end of it, he does the production, his mm -hmm. team puts all the pieces together. I prefer to be the, uh, I, the voice talent. I've got a great face for radio, but so uh, I'm the talent. I ask the questions, but one of the things we had always toyed about was these virtual book tours. And I love mm -hmm. the fact you're literally doing that for these scholars who are came into the library to study, find information, and now they're writing their books. And now you're a vehicle for them to come in, share their stories and promote their books. Yeah, it's great. It, we've seen a great success with our programming. We're really fortunate. And, and if anyone's interested, you can find them on Mount Vernon's YouTube channel. And selfishly for me, when I'm in the host chair, because usually I'm behind the scenes too, I'm, I'm producing those live streams, but you know, occasionally I'll get the first chair and it's great because you can have conversations with really smart people and it's just delightful. Yeah. So I'm curious the, about the questions that your researchers, educators, scholars are coming mm -hmm. in and asking about and, and, and by the way, I want to talk about intertwined, uh, sure. yeah. that podcast, as well as the other episodes on the George Washington podcast network. But what are some of the really unique questions that these folks are coming into the library to research and study? Cause there's, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's information to lawyers, questions of every mm -hmm. shape or size. And what are some examples? Yeah, I'll give you a, a good example. Actually, we just had a book talk recently with a former fellow named Keith Butler, uh, who's published a book called Washington's Hair. And his book is about the ways in which Americans in the 19th century begin to memorialize, commemorate, remember the founding generation and the ways in which we all, in certain respects, look back uh, on the past with kind of rose colored glasses in some ways and how Americans are doing that. And so he, he actually does a deep dive into who has locks of Washington's hair and what are they doing with them? How are they displaying them for public consumption? How are the audiences reacting to them in that period? It was a really interesting piece of research. Another colleague, Lydia Brandt, who is a professor at the University of South Carolina, she was a fellow here a few years ago. She's written a book about the ways in which Americans took the, the image of Mount Vernon, or at least the, the architectural framework of Mount Vernon, and began building similar sites around the country and incorporating that architecture. And then we've got a lot of, as you alluded to, a lot of research centered around the enslaved community here at, at Wash, here at Mount Vernon and, and 
as part of the broader Washington family. So Bruce Ragsdale, for example, has written a really important book recently called Washington at the Plow, The Founding Farmer and the Question of Slavery, that explores how Washington's interest in agriculture really inform the ways in which he begins to rethink his role as an enslaver and the enslaved community later in his life. And people have written about Washington and agricultural and agriculture before, but Bruce, Bruce has probably written the definitive count about Washington and agriculture and it's, it's fascinating. So, and other stuff as well. I just, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to think right now that some of the folks who are in doing research at the moment there's because there's so many really interesting questions and we also have colleagues upstairs in the library who are part of our collections department they have occasionally fellows coming in to study ceramic ron pukes who uh, is at actually washington and lee university he's an expert in chinese export porcelain and <laughs> and he he one day made the argument that you could tell an entire history through Chinese export porcelain. And by God, he did, because I had him on the podcast and I, I was kind of dumbfounded of the, the, the story he wove. It was just remarkable what some of our fellows are able to accomplish by virtue of working with our collections. That is fantastic. And let's talk a little bit now about the, the, the podcast network I used. When you started and you were sharing this, I think you and I started our podcast probably very similar time frames, but mm -hmm. what was the impetus around let's do a podcast? And that's pretty remarkable that you set out and you're still here. That's also remarkable. Yeah. So the, the podcast, the main podcast that we have is called Conversations at the Washington Library. And so it's the one that I currently host and produce. And it actually preceded me. It started when Douglas Bradburn, who was now president and CEO of Mount Vernon, was the founding director of the library back in the early 2010s. And he, I think he had the idea that, that he, they were having these great conversations with research fellows that would come through and someone was like, well, we should just record these. And so it kind of started like that. And it eventually has evolved over time into a podcast and you know, what, 2013, 2014, 2015, like history podcasting wasn't really a thing. My, uh, my friend, Liz Covart, who is the host of and creator of Ben Franklin's world, she was kind of like the first mover in that, in that space. And so conversations at the Washington library kind of came from that genesis. And so you know, after Doug became president, a couple of colleagues ran it for a while. And then when I was hired in 2019, I assumed command of the mission. Okay. Okay. And did you ever think going back, gee, I'm going to be a nationally recognized podcast host. I didn't. And I read, it's funny. I can remember distinctly the kind of the first time I ever heard the word podcast before I went back to graduate school, I worked at my alma mater, Miami university in Ohio in, in development. And our, our tech guy had, I guess what would be an early version of a snowball microphone. And he's like, oh yeah, we can use it for podcasting. And what's, what's a podcast. And so I knew going into this job that, that being the podcast host was part of it. I had never really done it. I don't think I had been on a podcast before, if I remember rightly. And so it's been a lot of learning uh, along the way. Uh, full disclosure, if you learn, or if you listen to some of those early episodes in my tenure, I don't know what I'm doing. But you have to sit down, buckle up, learn the process, both of how to actually be a host and how to um, ask questions and not get in the way of your guest, right? Which, Howard, you do a great job, uh, by the way. I've listened to a few of your stuff. I appreciate that. Yeah. And then uh, editing. I was not the best of editors back in the day. I'm, I'm a little better now, fortunately. And that's uh, a product, not only of me just sitting down and doing the work, but also being a part of a community that's very collaborative and willing to share tips and resources and, and help you along the way. So folks like Gabby Mullen and Jeanette Patrick have been critical to my development as a podcast host and producer. Fantastic. And as you have been producing these podcasts, and I was kind of in some ways joking about the celebrity aspect, but <laughs> Do you, no, do no, you no. Have, I'll take it. Yeah. Well, well, no, I'm being serious. I mean, you're, you are a celebrity. Do you ever run into somebody? It's like, God, I know that voice. I've heard that voice or they've listened to an episode and, and say, Jim, that was wonderful. I never knew that. Actually a couple of times. I All was, good. I hope All good. They, they, they were good. I actually, I was at Monticello. Actually, I have a research fellowship 
there right now, which I'm taking in chunks because of my, my regular day job. But I was in the library there at Monticello one day and I was talking and somebody heard me and they came up to me and I had my mask on wearing, wearing COVID times. I had my mask on. So you couldn't see me, my face, but they, but they heard it. And another fellow came up and, and paid me a really nice compliment and said, I love the podcast and, and thanks for doing that work. And you, you often don't hear from people unless something goes wrong. Uh, and that's when you hear from people. So to actually have a peer come up and say, you're, you're doing pretty good work. That was very gratifying. That is very gratifying. So let's talk a little bit about the, the special series, the intertwined, the enslaved community. And by the way, there's one episode I was listening to in, in the prep because I, I, I love cooking. And so I was really interested in the, the episode about the, 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 the chef that went a, AOL. Oh yeah. Uh, during, uh -huh. during Washington's birthday. Mm -hmm. Hurricane uh, Posey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And talk to us about the series, but there's actually something I was really drawn to in that particular story, but tell us sure. how the series come about. The origin of the series is actually in a museum exhibit that we had at Mount Vernon from 2016 through actually just last uh, November, November, 2021 called lives bound together. And it was the first major interpretive exhibition that Mount Vernon had done to tell the story of the enslaved community uh, and also to tell the story of the Washington's evolving views on slavery. And most museum expeditions only run about 18 months. So the fact that this ran from 2016 to 2021 uh, is pretty significant uh, and tells you uh, something about its importance and its significance. It was, it was, its deinstallation was delayed a little bit because of COVID, but Nevertheless, to be up that long is pretty impressive. And so, and actually, so Doug Bradburn, who I just actually mentioned a moment ago, had the idea of continuing that story in some way in podcast form. And I think that the original idea, they were thinking, well, we'll just take the museum labels and just read those or, you know, repackage those in some ways. The project came to me and my colleague, Jeanette Patrick, in the Center for Digital History here at the Washington Library. And we were very keen not to just replicate the exhibit, but we wanted it to be its own standalone thing that also took advantage of the latest research and scholarship about the enslaved community. So using books like Bruce Ragsdale's that I just mentioned ago as a, a key foundational text. And we were also keen to make this a podcast where it wasn't simply us telling a story, or in this case, Brenda Parker, who was our wonderful narrator telling the story, but to bring in really important and impressive scholars and members of the descendants community to help tell this story and to weave those various voices together so that we could tell that story of, of slavery at Mount Vernon, slavery in America, but it, most importantly, of course, the enslaved community at Mount Vernon from really the 17th century through the 21st century, in which we talk about how we interpret slavery here at the, the plantation today. And it was, our, our goal was to make something for the general public that they would find engaging, that they would find, that they would learn something from, something that teachers could assign in their classes, and something that moved broader conversations about race in America forward. And so hopefully we've, we've achieved that. An aspect of the, the story about Hercules Posey and for our listeners, we'll provide links obviously back to the intertwined podcast, but what I really thought was very interesting and your gate, your guest alluded to this mm -hmm. is the, not only the research that was available to her as she was studying, like what happened to this, this man but how she methodically was able to go up to New York, go back to look at the, the, the in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. the islands there, and be, and really was in some ways like a forensic researcher. I'm think I'm thinking of, I'm listening to a, a British crime drama on, on Amazon right now. I, and it, they're so much better than which you get in the U.S., but just the <laughs> methodical nature of which she did her research over the course of a number of years. It's not like it all, yeah. all gets done in 60 minutes. But I, I was thinking that the level of, of data that was available, the way she could go and do the research and find people to help fill the mm -hmm. gaps into the story about what happened to this individual, that to me was just amazing to listen to that. 
Yeah, it's it's a great story on it's it's a great story about Hercules Posey. It's a great story about the effort to figure out what happened to him after his whereabouts were unknown for more than 200 years. And so I won't spoil the story for your listeners so that they go and listen. But we're talking about Ramin Ganeshram and then her colleague, Sarah Krasny, who the, the two dogged researchers who figured out what happened. And it speaks to the tenaciousness that folks have to tell these stories and the, the significance in telling those stories and recovering those voices from the past. And for so long, right? Stories like Hercules, stories like Kate or Dahl or the other enslaved people here at Mount Vernon, they were always kind of in the background in, in favor of Washington. So dedicated folks like Ramin and Sarah have been out there getting those, getting those voices uh, back in the full public view. But it also is a good indication of the difficulty of reconstructing these stories. We don't often have the words of enslaved people. We just don't. Either they didn't read or write as a consequence of lack of education or the law, which restricted their ability to receive an education, or the documents have been lost. Ona Judge, who I think we mentioned earlier, is, is one of the only people, one of the only few people from the Washington's orbit whose words we have as a consequence of her giving a, a newspaper interview in the 1840s. And so Ramin and Sarah, they went to archives, they went to various places just to find little data points that they could then use to begin connecting those dots. And by golly, they, they did it. That was just fascinating. The music, let's talk about that because the mm -hmm. soundtrack for each episode, I mean, I have one soundtrack that I use episode after episode and right. I was like, I was having podcaster envy a little bit as I was listening. It's like, you've done a great job of first year, you've got the great intro and the outro and you, and you've got this music overlay. How did music play a role in the creation of your podcast at, at the Washington library? Yeah, it was really important. And I'll, I'll say full credit to our lead audio engineer, Kurt Dahl, who did a lot of the sound design and selecting the music. But we thought a lot about this because we knew we, knew we needed to set the tone appropriately. And music is you can enhance emotions or complement a narration in ways that helps you feel something that you might not otherwise. And no surprise to anyone, talking about the history of slavery and enslaved people can be a very traumatic and troubling story. And so... We wanted to find music, we wanted to use tracks that would not only amplify the tension in this story, but at times when we were really talking about something traumatic, and so episode four is a good example of that, we needed to find music that, in a sense, soften the blows, if that makes sense, that allows you to process the story that we're telling you in ways that, I guess, gives you a soft landing. This isn't the right description, but hopefully folks know what I mean. But as we began to actually write the series, we listened to a lot of music because we wanted to kind of get the, the tone right. And I, I actually took the lead on episode one, the opening episode of the series. And so I listened to a lot of classical music. I listened to a lot of dramatic classical music and kind of uh, tense classical music because that opening episode is about a man named Sambo Anderson, who's captured as a child in Africa and eventually is purchased by Washington in the 1760s. And so music was a critical, not only to orient ourselves as writers of the series, Jeanette and I as writers of the series, but then also to convey more meaning in subtle ways to the audience as the series goes along. And as you, you point out, we actually decided, well, we're just going to put together a, a soundtrack episode so people can listen to the whole thing. No, I thought it was fantastic. In fact, I was, as I was preparing the show now, so I was I was listening to episodes and I came to that like, oh, wow. I love that. Good yeah. job. So let's talk about the, just the, what's next for you? I mean, you've got, you've got a track record now, mm -hmm. a very successful podcast. I mean, you're continuing to evolve as a scholar, a digital historian, and what's next for you? Yeah, that's the perpetual question for the Sorry for historian. About that. Yeah. No, it's it's like there's like one of these memes these days that it's like <laughs> work I should be finishing. Oh, new research project or something like that. Shiny uh, objects, man. Shiny, shiny objects. objects. I here in my job job, we've got a few things going in terms of digital history. So right now we're working on a project to with our colleagues at the Washington Papers to publish Bushrod Washington's papers. Uh, Bushrod inherited Mount Vernon when George George was his uncle. He eventually becomes Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. 
And so we're working on the digital uh, publication of that. We are, I'm actually working with the descendants community right now, helping them with an oral history project, which is very exciting. And, but then in terms of podcast, the, the normal conversations podcast continues. The big question we are thinking about right now is what are we going to do for the 250th anniversary of the, the declaration of independence? And so there's going to be a lot of stuff coming out from various organizations between now and 2026. And what we've learned from doing intertwined is that you need a lot of lead up time to do something like that. It was about, it was, a, it was about an 18 month process for us to work on that show. We may not do something as complex again as that. We may maybe do something like a three episode mini arc, something, something along those lines, but we don't know yet. So we're, we're, what we're thinking about it. And then for myself, I'm trying to, the perpetual scholar's dilemma, trying to balance you know, stuff at everyday stuff at your job, but then also do your own research. And so I'm very slowly working on my own book which is a, the immigration of Scots to the North America during the era of the American Revolution and the political crisis that triggers on both sides of the Atlantic, right as the British and the Americans are trying to deal with the wider political crisis that's destabilizing the empire at that moment and leads to the outbreak of the war for independence. I was going to ask you, as a scholar and all that you have created, I know there's got to be a book in there somewhere. So I'm, I want to thank you for sharing about your book project. And the coach in me wants to ask you, so yeah. when is it, when do you want it to be published? I, it's a great question. Like last week, <laughs> right? <laughs> and again, going back to the beginning of our conversation, if I had been on the tenure track, likely the book would have been done by now because that's what you have to do to get tenure. You got to write that book, but I'm um, at a different career path is still in the history profession. So it's taking a little longer. I mean, my goal really, and I'm, I, it's, I'm writing it based on my dissertation. So a lot of the research is already done and now it's just a matter of, of transforming it. My goal is certainly is before 2026. I mean, hopefully within the next couple of years, but I have to say is that my experience doing things like podcasts and doing much more public history is, has led me to rethink how I write. And so, and as a consequence of not being on the tenure track, I have, I'm not obligated to write in a way that serves particular interests. And so I can write something that is much more accessible to a, a wider audience, still with the kind of scholarly rigor that my peers will demand of me in order to publish that book, but written in a way that is, um, more fun, I guess you might say. What kind of advice, Jim, would you give to someone young, perhaps coming out of high school, going into college, maybe they've watched a documentary that they, they've had that affinity for the, you know, the American revolution mm -hmm. period as you did, what advice would you give to them? If they were to say, I love what you do. I want to, I want to be just like you. What advice would you give? I think there are a few things, right? I, historians love talking to people. And so one of the things is, is simply shoot us an email and ask to set up an informational interview, right? We, I mean, everybody loves to be told that they're doing great work, right? <laughs> but especially if young people come up and say, Hey, I think you're doing something really cool. Would you mind spending 30 minutes and talking to me about it? I would say nine times out of 10, we would absolutely do that. Certainly I, I think, and it depends on what you're thinking about a career track, but you know, if you're thinking about podcasting, right, listen to the history podcast you really like, feel free to reach out to those folks, but also think about in a serious way, how those stories are put together from a, from a kind of a technical and a narrative standpoint. And don't be afraid to leap before you look, I think in this business, academia is like a constant battle of turning death into a fighting chance to live. And so you just have to learn to persevere. You have to follow your instincts. And at the end of the day, associate yourself with people who you think are doing great work and are willing to help you out uh, and shape your career path. I think sitting down and having a conversation or a cup of coffee with someone, or as we were talking about having this podcast being like a, a conversation with, with, with an old friend over an adult beverage. I think those little moments mean a lot and you may not get there as fast as you think you will, but if you start laying the groundwork, understanding that there will be hardships along the way and you may not succeed in the end, but you've got to try uh, and you've got to try for yourself. If that's what you really want to do.
you have to get into the arena or else you never know how things Ex are going exactly. to turn out. What did, what, did, what did Wayne Gretzky say? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take or something. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Jim, if our listeners would like to learn more about you, your work, the library, where are the best places for them to go? Yeah. So if you're interested in me, which is thank you, that's very nice of you. You can find me on my own personal website, which is uh, www.jamespmbuskey.com. My last name is spelled A-M-B-U-S-K-E. Um, the Washington Library, you can simply go to mountvernon.org slash library. And then to actually find the podcasts we have been talking about, just go to georgewashingtonpodcast.com and you'll see both the shows that we currently have. And uh, we'd love uh, to hear from you. Please rate and review both shows. If you're so inclined, uh, we'd, we'd appreciate the feedback and I hope you enjoy listening. Fantastic. Well, we will provide backlinks to your website, your social sites, LinkedIn, as well as the, the George uh, Washington Library, mountvernon.org forward slash library and we'll have the backlinks uh to the podcast as well and like i even share with my own listeners like share let us know let us know how we're doing nothing makes me feel better when somebody comments even if it's a comment they didn't i didn't like at least they took the time to comment. right at least they invested themselves in it for a few moments at least Fantastic. Well, Jim, I really appreciate your uh, willingness to come on to the, uh, the podcast and just uh, sharing a little bit about your story and your interest. And I am definitely going to get out uh, east because I want to come visit. <laughs> and woe to me because I didn't do it years ago and I had the chance. So I want to take care of that. Well, thank you very much for having me, Howard. And yes, please do let us know when you're coming and we will roll out the red carpet for you. Fantastic. Well, listen, stay on the line. I'm going to do a quick close and then you and I can have a final chat. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, folks. We have just been chatting with Jim Ambusky. He's a digital historian at the George Washington Library out in Mount Vernon. And really, it's just been a phenomenal conversation. And you know, what I love about this whole podcast sandbox that we're in is a lot of people are doing some very unique work and not everything is cut and dry and learning about Jim's work, le learning about his peers work and the, the, the mission of the library and really going beyond just what we learned back in, in school. And, and I'm reminded in, in the scholars that are studying these topics, I mean, we might study an entire football field and maybe you get a master's degree and we study a 10 yard line, but you have these scholars who are studying the, 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 the space between two blades of grass and, uh, and that's a real far out kind of analogy there or metaphor, but just the, the the interest in the revolution in this period, George Washington, and all the, the unique ways people are studying this information, and really the way that the library, through its digital uh, offerings, is presenting that in the form of the podcast and the conversations at the Washington Library, and really this unique podcast intertwined the enslaved community at George Washington's Mount Vernon. So whatever your interest, if you have any interest in this type of topic and the, the revolution era and George Washington, et cetera, this is a wonderful opportunity to whet your appetite for some really phenomenal conversation. So we do encourage you to go out to the sites. We're going to provide again, all the backlinks and as well as Jim's social site, LinkedIn and his website as well. As for us, let us know what you thought of today's episode, successinsightpodcast.com. We are also on Facebook and on LinkedIn on our success insight podcast pages. And you can also find us on all the major podcast platforms, just a few Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, Amazon music, Spotify, audible, listen notes, you name it. We're there. And we would love to hear what your thoughts are on this episode or any other episode, like it, comment, share it. And that, that helps us. And really that helps Jim out as, as well for his podcast. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we will see you on a future episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. 
Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com. 